what a blessing it is to be here today with you. We thank God for this opportunity to worship Him in spirit and in truth. For it is because of His amazing grace we are able to experience His presence through worship one more time. God, we thank you today for this opportunity to worship you in spirit and in truth. Touch hearts, touch minds, touch souls, Lord. Feed us from on high. We thank you, God. We reverence you. We honor you. We glorify you, God. We humble ourselves before you. Consecrate our hearts and our minds that we may worship you in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name. Glory and honor, they are. 
announcements for the week. Are you excited? We will be worshiping in the sanctuary again very soon. We are asking every member to pray daily for a mighty move of God. Pray that services and efforts are God-centered. We truly, He truly deserves our highest praise, total focus, and spiritual best. Think of those who wish they could be here, but are limited. We owe it to God, we owe it to our brothers and sisters to worship in spirit and in truth. In Sanctuary Worship begins August the 1st of 2021. What is available on Sunday morning? 9.30 a.m. Sunday School, one combined class in the Sanctuary, 10.45 a.m. Morning Worship in the Sanctuary. There are entrance requirements. Everyone must wear a mask, must have temperature checked, must allow recording of name for attendance records, must maintain social distancing, and must follow guidance of host team. Community cleanup, church overhaul. Come one, come all on Saturday, July 24th. It is time to clean God's house. The trustee ministry is leading our effort to clean out our main facility and the annex. We need your presence and physical efforts. We will be removing outdated equipment, broken furniture, unused materials, and other items. Together, we can do it quickly and efficiently. Dumpsters will be available for the Carson Homes community to discard non-toxic waste materials like old furniture and trash. Brothers and sisters on the move. Tomorrow evening at 6.30 p.m., our Brotherhood and Christian Women's Ministries will convene via phone dial-in for their first meetings of the summer. All men and women of St. Stephen's are welcomed. Great things happen when we bind together in number. 50 State T. Have you been notified by your team leader that it is time to get your pictures to Deacon Swindell? If so, please do so as soon as possible. You may either mail or text the pictures to him. We encourage you to contact Deacon Swindell directly for assistance. As a backup, you may call the church office and your messages will be forwarded to him. Thank you, minister, deacon, trustee, wives, and widows, for leading this Herculean effort. Psst. Our Bible studies are pretty great. Try one this week. Spiritual PPE. I was glad when they said unto me, Let us go into the house of the Lord. Our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Psalm 122, 1 through 2, New King James Version. These have been your announcements for the week. Let us govern ourselves accordingly. She was struggling with the sense that God wanted her to make herself available for greater forms of service. 
Her period of intense prayer and fasting revealed to her that God had more in store for her. As she looked at the more traditional areas of former church ministry, she did not see herself in any of these roles. She realized that preparation for her ministry would probably involve enrolling in Bible college or seminary for training. As Cheryl considered the possibilities for her life, she began to grow concerned about having to give up her current job and standard of living. I worked so hard to achieve everything, she thought. She also began to fear that her fiancé, Dwayne, might not understand. Maybe he'll call off the wedding, she feared. Am I willing to give up the career and the man I love to do the Lord's will? She asked herself over and over. Cheryl grew embarrassed and ashamed. How she wished she could readily respond yes, but she knew that she had not reached that point of her faith journey. As she pondered the matter over and over, she could reach no simple solution. Finally, she realized that the dilemma was not hers to solve. She knew that the God she served would show her the right steps to take. For now, she resolved, I'll just take the first step. Whatever happens later, I'll have to trust that the Lord will work it all out. What aspects of life hinder us from unabashedly following God's will for our lives and personal ministries? How do we push back against those hindrances?
Heavenly Father, we bow now at our altar, God, our altar in our homes, our altar in the pews of your house, our altars, Lord, in our hospital beds. Father, wherever we are, we now present ourselves to you. God, we thank you for this opportunity to call on your name one more time. Lord, will you look upon us and forgive us of our sins, Heavenly Father. We pray, O oh God, for cleansing. and We pray for strength to overcome our weaknesses, Father. We pray for vision to see your will for our life. We pray for hearing, God, to hear the whisper of your Spirit speaking to us on a daily basis. Lord, we thank you for this day as we come before you, Heavenly Father. We lift up those that are bereaved, God. So many are wrestling with decisions that you have made. And God, we don't understand why, but we do know that you are a sovereign God. And God, all that you do is wise and perfect. So Father, in your perfection, Comfort us. Help us to see your glory in every situation. Help us, God, to know that you're with us. Help us, Father, to be able to comfort one another. God, we thank you for your glory. We thank you for your covering. You've done so much, Heavenly Father. You keep making ways out of no way. You keep protecting us, Father, when we don't know we need protection. Lord, thank you. We lift this country up to you, Father, and all countries. There seems to be a lost God of reverence to you. There seems to be confusion as to who we should believe in and how we should believe. God, help us today to cry out unto you as your church, Father, on behalf of all of mankind. We call on you today, Lord, to help all of us, Father. Help us first to know you. And then help us first, God, to right our wrongs, God. Lord, in the name of Jesus, help your church to be a beacon of hope, a beacon of light, Heavenly Father. Lord, show us how to help others. Show us how to strengthen the brothers and the sisters that are in the family. Show us, God, what to do, and we will be obedient unto you. Lord, have your way. Have your way in the lives of our families, God in the lives of our neighborhoods, God, in the lives of our work environments. God, thank you for your covering. Thank you for your protection. We lift this virus situation up to you. Bind it, God, in the name of Jesus. Thank you for your protection over the days, over the months, over the years. God, thank you for always being there. Thank you for being our hope. Thank you for being our help. Thank you, God, for what you are doing. In this situation, oh God, bless your word. We love your spirit, God. We receive your spirit, God. We in rejoice in your spirit, God. Thank you for you, Lord. Thank you even right now, God. Fill us, Heavenly Father. Fill us even now, God. Oh God, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Father, for all that you are. Thank you, God. We reverence you. We love you, God. Thank you. Thank you. Have your way, God. Have your way in me. In Jesus' name, amen.
brothers and sisters in Christ, I greet you in Jesus' name. This morning, the Lord is going to speak with us on a word that's going to come from the third chapter of Genesis in the beginning. When we take a look at our relationship that we have with our God and with the Son, our Savior, and with the Holy Spirit, we need to understand one thing, that the Lord God loved us so much that he forgave us. Now, what he forgave us for is an awesome thing because the one thing we need to understand that he has given us all a dominion here in the lives that we have and the homes and everything that we have. And if anybody was to come into our home, we know that we all have what we call our rules that we have in our homes because God has given us dominion of these houses and these these lives and even in your very personal life there are certain things that you do not want to be crossed certain things and actions you don't want to take it against us and you let people know so when the lord god had created the heavens and the earth and when he fashioned man and man and woman and he placed them in the garden planet called eden on his earth he gave just one rule, and he said, do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And he gave the consequences. He said, for in the day that you do eat it, ye shall die. And so we broke God's law. And also, if you would take a look at the 12th chapter of the book, the Revelation, you saw that there was a wonder, there was a war in heaven because one of the created beings, being the angel named Lucifer, decided to have a revolt in God's heaven because he wanted to take over God's heaven. And of course, you know, because of that, God cast him through the earth into a place that he created called hell for him. But when he was there, we would check the writing and the record in the 28th chapter of Ezekiel around the first through the 19th verses, you will find that that being Lucifer, when God changed his name and, and called him the devil and called him Satan, he was also there in the Garden of Eden. It's recorded in the word. He was there in the form he had overtaken the serpent. And he beguiled Eve and Adam and caused them to transgress the one rule, the one law that was in the garden, and that was to not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, we're going to go and we're going to take a deeper look, but we're going to do a summary right now to bring the point of the topic that the Lord would have us to hear this morning. Now, the topic is going to be, did anybody apologize, which means ask for forgiveness in Eden? Because we know when we transgress against someone, that the proper thing to do is to formally and in real and in heart apologize to that person for the transgression that we have committed. But if we take a look at the record, Nobody in the garden apologized or asked forgiveness of God between Adam, Eve, and the serpent. Nobody asked forgiveness. And we need to take a look and understand something about why it went the way it went and the reason that God did what he did and him being all-knowing because this 
action that God takes. And it was an action that was already planned because he is omniscient. He already know what was going to happen. But we're going to see how also this just enhances our thought and personally to me about how awesome the act of the amazing grace that God performed from the beginning and the foundations on the earth, even until right now until the day that he's going to take us home and we're all going to be judged is an awesome act because if anyone was to come into your home, and I will tell you also my home, and transgress and does not even give the decency to ask forgiveness and to apologize once they're caught wrong, that person's going to be put out, and I will be very wrought with that person. So now let's take a look at this scene in the third chapter of Genesis, beginning at verse third chapter, verse one. And also remember that this has already come up to the point where God has created the man and he has taken out of the man the rib and formed Eve, the woman, and put them in and given them the orders to till the ground, but also to multiply and replenish the earth. And all is at peace because every day at the noonday hour, the Lord God would come down into the earth and walk and he would commune and when i know when you commune with god you learn so he was teaching them and they had a wonderful relationship and then comes this point at the third chapter now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the lord god had made and he said unto the woman Yea, has God said, ye shall not eat of every tree in the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, and then your eyes shall be opened, ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave it also to her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and they themselves aprons. And they heard, and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden and the Lord God called and said Adam and said unto Adam where art thou and he said I heard thy voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself and he said who told thee that thou was naked Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat and at that point we're going to pick up on what the Lord is talking about right here. The first thing Adam did was hide. He and Eve both. Instead of going to the Lord and knowing of the relationship that they had, the loving relationship, and going to the Lord with this problem and this trauma. But the first thing that came into their mind was to hide from the loving God. That means something that changed in them. And you notice when it said their eyes became open, that means that something was anew to them in their mind and their concept and their thinking had never been there before. And the first thing that Adam did and the man started accusing the woman. Now God had put the man there and he gave the man the charge. And the man was to give that charge to the woman. And the serpent knew of all this because if you look in the 28th chapter of Ezekiel, like it said, the serpent was under the influence of the spirit of evil being 
the devil himself. And so what the devil was doing, he was trying to do what he's always wanted to do was to shake and to break up the relationship that God had formed with man from the very beginning. Because when you look at the 14th chapter of Isaiah and you look at that 28th chapter of Ezekiel and you look at that 12th chapter of the Revelation, it is all throughout the Bible that Lucifer decided that he wanted to be greater than God. And there is none that is greater than God. And so when man and woman got the knowledge, not the wisdom and the understanding of how to use the knowledge of knowing good and evil, it drove us to the point of insanity. I call it insanity because we began to think that we can outsmart and outwit God. And whenever you do that, you've put yourself in a position of being an enemy of God. And the back point is coming to of how wonderful the act of love that God did was that before he even formed the heavens and the earth, before he even made man, before he even brought us in, he and his son Jesus and the Holy Spirit did a wonderful thing. They said, we're going to make a way to where we can restore this relationship that is the apple of God's eye. God loved man so much as we love the quote in John 3, 16, that God so loved, how much so loved, he loved us so much that he and his son and the spirit made a pact to where they were going to do the only thing that can restore the relationship. Because that's what apologies are for, is when you severed a relationship and when you severed a trust that means so much, Something has to be done that is worthy to restore that relationship that caused so much pain. And one of the reasons why people shy away, we shy away from wanting to truly deep hearted apologize is because it hurts. If you truly love someone, when you hurt that person, you feel the pain of seeing the pain in them. And did Adam or Eve or even the serpent look and see the pain that we caused the Lord God when we broke his treaty? Think about that you are all powerful. We as parents, when our children break our heart and we look at them and we know that they really have no apology in their heart. They do it with no remorse. And all that comes out of them are excuses and try to lay the blame on somebody else, how that makes you feel. Do we stop sometimes and think about how we grieve the heart of God when we do the things that we do and how we are even capable of doing that and realize that there's one interloper that we have allowed to come into our lives and have given power to that God and only God can rescue us from that and he chose to do it. Because when we look at the ninth chapter of the book of the Hebrews, it says, and we love the quote, it said, there's no, no remission of sin without the shedding of blood. But yes, but there's only one type of blood that they, God had tried to get when he gave the law to man, when he drove man out of the garden to keep man to get something back inside of them. Because when you look at the end of the third chapter, this very chapter that we're reading now, we'll see that when it was all over, yes, we know when it says God, he told the man, you're going to till the soil and you're going to have blood. You're going to have to go sweat and toil. No longer will the ground and the earth yield to you freely as it did before. Do we realize that what we do disrupts the whole order of life when we do things? And when we look at it, has any of us truly come to God and said, we're sorry. Yes, you repent, you start doing 
and you start changing your ways, but how does it affect us in our hearts when we look? Do we really feel sorry to God for what we do? And do we stop and think about how much God loves us when we really totally have not been repentant? This is what drove Paul to write the seventh chapter of Romans when he realized that he knew he was saved because Jesus personally came to him and he knew that he went and the Lord took him to the backside of the mountains for six months and brought him back and done all these things and he was able to read and to understand and to pin the words of the Bible that God has allowed him to, but he still realized, I still transgress the law of God. I still sin. And he had to realize in him what God had to overcome that Lucifer knew that he was going to do. And what happened in the garden was that he started a war inside each and every one of us that God knew only he could bring victory through and he knew what he had to do. And the ultimate thing is he and his son and his spirit decided to do it, even though they knew it was going to happen. Each one of us, if we knew how to stop all the pain that we have in our life, if we knew that there's something that we could do, would we do what God did? Could we go on without someone apologizing and someone coming to us and wholeheartedly asking, not just saying, I forgive you, just like the Lord Jesus knew when he was here on this earth and he told us who were living and disciples, whenever the scribes and the Pharisees would come and he said, you just worship me with your mouths. When God knows your heart, as it's recorded in the 139th number of Psalms, God knows our thoughts. He knows every word that's going to come out of our mouth before it comes out of our mouth, but still he chooses to love us. He chose to save us in spite of knowing that each one of our hearts had turned dark. And Jesus knew that he was the only one that can do it because he was the only one that could come and live this life in front of us and show us exactly how we were supposed to live. And even in living that perfect life, he had to die and he had to take his father's full wrath so his father could be put back in relationship with each and every one of us? Do we stop sometimes and consider what we do? Because I'm sure that if we did, if we did not have the knowledge of sin in us and the power of sin over us that we cannot overcome without Jesus having to die and shed blood to satisfy the father. Do we stop sometimes and think about what we do and the consequences? That's how come James says that we need to be quick to listen. Listen to who? Listen to God. In everything that happens, God will show us through his spirit that we have the omniscience that is the Holy Spirit. We have the omnipotent power. We have the omnipresence of the Holy Spirit and the omniscience of the Christ. All of that is at our disposal if we'll just stop and listen and to consider it. No, I have not mastered it yet. Even when God gives me this understanding of his word, just like he gives you, do we stop sometime and just think about it? It should bring tears to our eyes and our hearts when Paul came and asked the Lord three times, but the Lord knows that if I take this out of them. I'll lose control of them until I'm able to put them into the perfect being and the new bodies that he has for us to where he can separate us from that knowledge of evil. There's nothing wrong with God telling us that there's a tree that has the knowledge of the truth and that tree is life. But we fell for the temptation. And we still fall for the temptation. And that's why the serpent, the devil, Lucifer, used the serpent. Satan used the serpent to beguile us. Because when you look at that word subtlety, the only time that he was ever gentle to us, he still had a 
he had an ulterior motive. And God wanted to see if we could fight it without him telling us directly, but he gave us instruction that was good enough to protect us. He said, don't do it. Even to this day right now, he says, don't do it. Because we know that when we look at that same seventh chapter of Romans, Paul said, when I would do good, that means that the thought of good is there, the want and the intent is there, but there's another want and intent that God tried to save us from and to keep us from, but we willingly took it in, and now he has to do what it takes, and he did what it took to eradicate it, but do we use each part of that? Do we give God that control in our life? Because we must, because the Lord promises us, until we do, he will not know us. That's what he said when he was talking about in the seventh chapter of Matthew, it's not all those crying, Lord, Lord, because when we say, Lord, Lord, the Lord Jesus wrote through James. When we look at the second chapter of James, he said, if you believe there's one God, you believe well, because the very demons believe and tremble. Lucifer knew who he was going up against, but he was mad and that, that sin that entered into him drove him to the point to think the unthinkable that I can overcome God and that's insanity in itself because God is all powerful and he proves it every day. So when we stop and we think about when God created Eve, and Adam and put them in the garden and his own, he gave us his own image. He gave us his own likeness. He gave us all that we needed. And he created the earth lovingly thinking about us and how we would be in it. And then he gave it to us. And all he asked us to do was just obey it and have fellowship with him. But because of our curiosity, and even when we did it and he watched it, he knew we did it, he still lovingly came down into the garden. And he gave us a chance to confess and a chance to apologize, but we did neither. And he knew that we were going to do neither, but he had made a plan before he even created us to bring us back into relationship with him. Now do we stop and think about, do when we come and when the disciples used to see the relationship that Jesus had with the Lord God, that when they would talk and pray, when God even taught us how to pray, gave us the right to pray and commune with us, it did not have the same effect as they saw when Jesus would pray and talk to his father and Jesus taught us how to pray teaches us how to pray, but for some reason, it just doesn't have the same effect. That's because of the sin that is in us that the Lord God had to eradicate when Jesus took it all the way to the cross. What love God has for us. God so loved this world that he gave his only begotten son that once we believe that we have sinned and believe that Jesus came and he lived the life, hung, bled, died, but most of all, God resurrected him and now he gives us the power of forgiveness. Do we accept him? God bless you for hearing his word, but let's realize the omni love that God demonstrated for us. God bless you, God keep you, is my prayer. Thank you for the word, Reverend Johnson. Anytime the word of God is proclaimed, there ought to be a response. And the best response one can give is to repent of their sins and give their soul to Christ. Is that you today? If you have not accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, today is a very good day. Confess with your mouth that He is the Son of God. 
that he did die on Calvary. Believe in your heart that God did raise him from the dead. The book of Romans teaches us that you shall be saved, not because of anything that man does, but by the grace of God. We want you to know Jesus for yourself, so this appeal is directly to you. We're concerned about your soul's safety. We're concerned about your soul's health. Get right with the Lord today. We offer Christ to you. Father, bless those who have accepted Christ today. All over the land, Lord, all over this globe. In Jesus' name, amen.